I do read and reply to as many comments as I can, but it is getting more difficult as the volume increases, but I find a huge inspiration in the comments for future videos. It also allows me to target those future videos to subjects that I know are of interest to you. Well, I get asked, what is one pedal driving and do you recommend it? Ah, yeah, without a doubt. Well, let me explain. With a petrol or diesel car, if you want to slow down, you normally just apply the brakes. You have disc pads that squeeze the discs. Slowing them down, it produces heat and some brake dust in the process. An electric car has a very different method of slowing down. Every electric motor is also a generator. It's whatever you do with it. If you put electricity in, then it becomes a motor and it turns the wheels. If you turn the wheels, then it acts like a generator and produces electricity. And manufacturers use this to their advantage. If you want to stop, you could just use the brakes like before. You've got them, they're there. But if you ask the motor to become a generator, then slowing down will produce electricity and that will recharge your battery. Free energy. In an EV, if you take your foot off the accelerator, it will feel like you've pressed the brake pedal. It's, it will really stop quite quickly. And this is because it extends your range. If every time you slow down and stop, you put some charge back into the battery, it gives you greater range. And most cars allow you to adjust how fast they slow down. How slowly fast? Yeah. Um, in your, uh, uh, thus, how much charge you put back in your battery. And many will bring the car to a complete halt and then hold it there like you've applied the handbrake. Now, if you judge it just right, you never actually need to use your real brakes at all. This is one pedal driving. Press the accelerator go to go, release the accelerator to stop. And of course, you can at any time stamp on the brake pedal in an emergency. Now, it simplifies driving once you get used to it. Some people never do get used to it. That's your choice, but I recommend it. Well, I've been told I can fit 20 inch wheels on my car, which has 19 inch wheels fitted at the moment. How and why would I do that? Well, this is a good question. It's a very popular one. It's a slightly nerdy answer, I'm afraid. Well, your car is designed to ride at a specific height above the road. The lower the better for aerodynamics and economy, the higher the better if you're going over bumps into potholes and over curbs. Your 19 inch wheels will have a specific tyre on it. Maybe, if I use mine as an example, I have 245, 45 R19 wheels, tyres. This means it's 245 millimetre wide and the height of the tyre wall from the metal rim to the tread is 45% of the width and this 19 inches in diameter. If you just fit a 20 inch wheel, the car would be much higher off the ground. So normally you would adjust the aspect ratio to, I don't know, 30, 35% to compensate and keep the same height. Well, some people like the look of a bigger wheel and a reduced tyre wall height. They think it looks cool. But with less tyre wall, the tyre is less flexible. This will give you marginally better road holding if you have to throw your car around a bend, but it will be a noticeably harsher ride with potential damage if you hit potholes. So, it's your choice. Is looking better worth risking tyre damage and a sore back? Winter's approaching. What can I do to extend my range? Well, the first rule is the range will be less in winter, full stop. But there are things you can do. First, always precondition your car before setting off in the morning. Your car will be stone cold, as will the battery. Pre-warming the car also pre-warms the battery, and that makes it more efficient. If you charge at home overnight, pre-warming will use your house electricity, not the car battery. So if you pre-warm while it's plugged in, you'll set off with a nice warm car and a fuller battery than if you do the warming once you set off. Well, next, keep the heat down. If you think about it, we're usually happy to sit out on a summer's day with the temperature around about 18 or 20 degrees centigrade. 
Or in the car, try and keep your temperature down to about 18 degrees, if you still feel comfortable. There's no point being cold, but most people are fairly comfortable around that. But also, use your seat heaters. They use much less power, but they make you feel warmer. Another tip, keep your coat on. You're going to be getting in and out when you get there when you set off. Uh, so just keep your coat on. Uh, that will cut down the amount of heat that you need. I was told that an EV produces more carbon dioxide than a diesel car and it takes 70,000 miles before it gets it back in savings. Is this true? OK, no. Ha. The figures they use are correct, but they're deliberately selective in what figures they do use. So let's look at the facts. First, an EV does produce more CO2 in the manufacture of the components and the assembly than an equivalent petrol or diesel car. But not by very much. It is more, but not much. But once made, the EV then produces zero CO2 or any emissions from the exhaust pipe. Well, they don't have an exhaust pipe. So every mile you drive, you will compensate for the extra in production. But here's where the figures differ. You see, when they compare the CO2, they conveniently forget to calculate the CO2 produced by oil drilling, transporting crude oil, refining it into petrol or diesel, transforming them, then burning in a petrol or diesel car. Not a single gram or ounce of CO2 is included in those calculations. So it's totally fictitious. If you bought your petrol car and never ever drove it, not even a single mile, just put it in a garage, then it might take thousands of miles to get back the extra that your car created when being made. But we don't buy cars to sit in a garage, never being used. If we add in the CO2 produced in every single litre of fuel you put in your car, it very quickly overtakes the EV. Now, if you also add in the CO2 you actually produce when the fuel is burned in your ice engine, the equation really falls apart. Over the lifetime of an EV, it is significantly better producing far less CO2 than any ice car. And most importantly, something they forget, they have zero emissions from it, meaning cleaner air in our streets and our cities. We want to thank you for watching our long cast. Dave takes it on. And if you like what we do, what we ask of you is to click that like and subscribe to follow along.